Hey guys, JB here from Alpha Wolf Consulting. Coming to you today with the next lesson in the Introduction to Sales and Communications course, um, which is all about the three core elements of communication. So what we got to understand is there are three forms that our communication um, is basically conveyed through. So first is our body language, so our facial expressions, our facial features, how we, you know, how we look when we're processing information or when we're communicating, how we look when we are in the process of explaining or in the process of demonstrating. So our facial expressions give off our underlying emotional state. The next is our tonality. So our tonalities are very important because they, they're a way for us to communicate things like alarm, alertness, you know, our inner, um, for example, emotional states like being happy, sad, and all of this. So our tones are a really, really good way that we're able to convey, you know, if someone said something hurtful to us and we we were hurt by what they said, maybe when we, the tone we use when we're talking to them is one that is a lower tone, a sort of defeated tone, where it's sort of melatonin and we're sort of just sad and, you know, we're, we're sort of meek or, or sort of making ourselves smaller or things like that. So our tonalities are very important because they can convey, for example, if we don't have, you know, tonality control in terms of when we're communicating, people can imply that, for example, you know, we're not confident in what we're saying. We're not, you know, th there's something about us. We, we don't, you know, trust the words that we are saying. So it's sort of like if you think about speaking with conviction. So speaking with conviction is just a tonal shift and a language shift in terms of how we pro how we how we communicate data. So when we talk very, you know, certain about, you know, what we are saying, we are going to be very direct and very sort of stern. We we put emphasis and pause behind the the like words of relevance or the language of relevance. So if we're explaining something, for example, let's take a scenario that we're explaining mechanics. When, when we get to a point of, let's say we're talking someone through doing a service. So where we get to, let's say the fuel filter. Now the fuel filter needs to be changed on every service. So we would say it in a way where we're emphasizing out of all of these different components on the car, when we're servicing, the fuel filter or the oil filter needs to be changed every time. And what that does to the person we're communicating with is it allows them to identify that as being something of relevance and importance. Whereas if we said to them, you know, the fuel filter should be changed on every service. Oh, okay. Okay. So, so when we emphasize something, we are sort of helping someone to lock it into memory as being something of relevance and important importance. So that's an important thing to understand about language in terms of when we are communicating in our communicating styles is that we are trying to identify the, the best and most effective ways to communicate our wants and needs to get the outcomes that we want. So for example, how we communicate or how we go about communicating will, will determine a lot around, you know, the outcomes that we get. For example, if we don't take the, uh, the time when, let's say, training someone how to do a service to emphasize all the critical components that need to be identified and take the time to effectively, you know, explain, demonstrate, you know, you know, educate them on, on the relevance and importance, what happens is they are unaware 
of relevance and importance because all of the, let's say, you know, the parts look the same. So if we think about this, okay, when we are selling to a prospective buyer, this is what we are trying to do. We are trying to communicate our product or service in a way to where we're able to emphasize crucial information or sales important information. So information that's highly relevant to sales. So let's say we're doing a marketing business, you know, things like results, things like outcomes for past or current clients, things like that. They're, they're of relevance because we want the client to be thinking about that. Okay. We want the client to be focused on, well, this is what other people are getting. So we don't want to just say, you know, for example, our, you know, our marketing business gets, you know, such good results for our clients. And that's that. No, we want to emphasize, educate, expand on. So, you know, we would be talking about, well, I know you're in, and let's say they're in e-commerce. I know you're in e-commerce. Here's a couple of other e-commerce brands that we're working with. And some of the relevant things that we were able to identify for them and, you know, the relevant things or, or goals or outcomes we were able to achieve with them can point you and help us to determine more effective strategies for your business to be able to, you know, create, you know, hybrid models based off already tested and proven met, um, metrics or not metrics, but processes and practices, theories, you know, ways of doing things. So we're able to go through and we can even go deeper into that. So just by understanding that we have to be aware of our body language, we have to be aware of our tonality because it does alter the meaning that, that someone interprets, okay? And then last, lastly, we got our language patterns. So the way in which we construct our language, but also the relevance we put on language. So for example, if we are selling marketing services, we don't wanna be talking about IT help because it's not really relevant to us communicating, you know, the effectiveness of our marketing. So we want to keep everything, the language around it relevant to the, you know, objectives or the goals we're trying to do or what we're trying to communicate. But also what we're trying to do is use language that creates either a specific sensation or experience or language that aligns. So when we think about a language pattern, we're thinking not just about the language that we speak, but we're also thinking about the interpretation that a consumer or a potential buyer is sort of having. So we're trying to understand when we're talking about, let's say, you know, marketing results and we're talking about, you know, um, our past client's profit and how, you know, and the, and the outcomes that they had in the results and we're discussing strategy. Well, it's very, very important that we create language that is going to create a highly enjoyable experience that allows us to transfer the most amount of data in the most effective ways. So for example, we can construct our conversation and our language to be highly complex and very sophisticated, but that will require a far greater amount of, you know, education and familiarization with language and terminology. Or we can construct it to be simple and easy to understand. And then we can try and take a complex and highly, like a complex and very, you know, um, sort of we're taking complex ideas and then we're breaking them down into highly relatable and easy to understand sort of narratives or language patterns. So in terms of, for example, if we're talking about our marketing services and how they, our previous clients, and let's say we were talking about the results we were able to get for them in comparison to the marketing company that they had prior to us. 
Okay, so we would want to be talking about the results, but we don't want to be talking about, you know, in terms of when we're talking about reach and, and you know, our impact and, you know, how the effectiveness of the correlation between the different ad sets we run and the different reactions and outcomes and behaviors that we see in consumers. So when we're trying, if we're trying to explain that at a very complex level, it's going to be very, very difficult for someone who doesn't have a key understanding of the topic to follow along. So what we're looking to do is we're looking to use simple analogies to break it down and make our communication easier. So by relating, you know, <clears throat> an easy one is by relating, you know, high performance to a high performance vehicle or a high performance car and low performance to an average to a moderate car. So we're using terminology that people can understand because people have seen, for example, a Ferrari. So they may not have seen it in person, but they've seen the quality of the workmanship. They've seen the performance of the engine. They've seen, you know, the branding. So we're able to leverage on to brands, to associations, to pre-education, so that's sort of one of the things when we're communicating in sales is we're trying to identify how does this customer understand and perceive information and how can I tailor the information I'm giving them to be e as easy for them to comprehend and understand. So for example, if someone likes boats, we can use boats. If someone, you know, is a fisherman, if someone is a golfer, like we're trying to find relatable topics in terms of relatable you know analogies that we can use or topics of analogies so like for example we can use business we can use politics we can use education and learning like what we're trying to do with an analogy is we're trying to demonstrate what we or uh, what we are saying so we're trying to demonstrate what we are saying to the the consumer while we are explaining it. So we're not trying to say, these are the results we get. We're explaining and demonstrating how we get those results. Do you sort of understand? So it's sort of, it's important because the language in which we use and how we construct it and where we put our emphasis with the language. Okay. So do we emphasize the results? Do we emphasize the process? Do we emphasize you know, niche language? Do we emphasize general and industry terminology? For example, if we are a mechanic, we wouldn't really want to be talking like someone who doesn't understand uh, mechanics because it's going to lead to a lot more ambiguity. So for example, if you said, oh, I'm having issues with my car starting, the mechanic wouldn't say, oh, is it, you know, is it, the electrical system, no, they'd say, is it the alternator? Like they use specific industry knowledge and terminology to identify exactly what it is, even if you don't understand what it is. If they said, oh, is it the electrical system? Well, it could be a range of different problems or different issues that, that could cause the issue. So by, by having it broad and sort of talking broadly and not being specific on understanding and interpreting what the consumer or the customer is talking about and trying to use too generalized language doesn't always work. So for example, if we're using, for example, insurance, if we're selling insurance and let's say it's life insurance, well, then we don't really wanna be using industry specific terminology in terms of like, we want to be talking to people around their health, around their life, because that's what's important to them. When it when we're talking about like, for example, a mechanic or a doctor, like we wouldn't want to go to the doctor saying, I think I'm really sick. And the doctor says, I wonder what it could be. Like that doesn't really help us. So to understand this is just to understand that in, in some scenarios, we want to identify and solve problems 
prior to the consumer understanding them. In other scenarios, we want to take the consumer on a journey of self-discovery. So to understand this is just to understand in some scenarios, in some situations, a consumer will want a direct response and direct understanding, okay, where you're telling them exactly what everything is. In other times, consumers will want to go on a journey of self-discovery. So if we think about this in terms of like buying a car, well, some people... They know exactly the car they want. They know the price point they're after and they just want to find something within that price point. And if it all looks good, they're happy. So they have very, very industry specific questions. So they'll be talking about speedometer. They'll be talking about, you know, engine, past, you know, past mechanical history, you know, logbook. They'll be talking about, you know, all of this other stuff. Whereas someone who's going on the journey to find, you know, the car that they want, their dream car, is going to be looking and, and talking in a much different way. And they're going to be more concerned with, you know, sort of their personal bias. Instead of being more factual, they're going to be more emotional. Okay. So an easy way to understand this is in in, in business is just the segregation between B2B and B2C. In B2C, it's more about the experience. In B2B, it's more about the process. So in B2B, we're looking to be as time effective as we can in terms of if I'm a manufacturing company that's looking to buy supplies, well, I don't want to go on a journey to buy the supplies. I want to talk to someone who knows exactly what I need understands exactly what I need. So I'm able to communicate directly with them, you know, in very, very specific terminology and specific language. And I want them to be able to give me uh, expedited timeframes. So I want to be able to cut out as many steps as I can, okay, to make it as streamlined and smooth of a process, i.e., for example, instead of me going to a business and, you know, just looking around the showroom at all the different products, if it's a B2B, well, I would be assigned a case manager or, you know, a representative of the company, a sales agent who manages, you know, clients and all the clients of the business and just make sure that they're always, you know, got what they need, any any questions they have, they're, they're answered and all of this, okay? So we just got to understand that segregation because, some B2C clients, so business to customer, will hold the attributes and, and want the experience of a B2B customer. And just to the same, some B2B customers will want the the experience of being a customer. So we just got to understand that, that it's sort of this, this mesh between being direct and giving someone exactly what they need but also helping someone to discover what they need. So it's sort of like this. We, do, we, wouldn't, we wouldn't give someone investment advice and then try and ask them if they wanted to get investment advice afterwards. You know what I mean? Like if we were a financial planner and we went out and did something, you know, you know, set up an investment account for someone and did all the trading for them, did all the research, gave them all the research, and then ask them, hey, would you like to pay for this service? Or would you, or do you just want it for free? Like every day of the week, they're going to want it for free because they've already got it. They don't, it's sort of like, you know, an easy, an easy analogy is, is with food. So it's sort of like prior to being, when you're hungry, so, so before you eat when you're hungry, like the point at which it is, most easy and effective for you to self-identify what you want. So the product or service that you want is right before you eat. In terms of if I'm if I'm hungry, a little bit hungry, well, I'm going to look around. Maybe I feel like Chinese. Maybe I feel like Thai. Maybe I feel like Indian. If I'm absolutely starving, the first food is what I want. Like I'm decision made, okay? 
But if you were to come to me after I ate and then said, hey, do you want to go and eat at this place? Well, I've already eaten. If you got me in that period between being really hungry and starving, I would have gone straight with you. Like with, with certain expectations or certain causes. So to understand this is to understand the buying cycle. So when a buyer is educated and they understand the problem, they understand the opportunity costs, they understand the opportunity losses and um, and the benefits and all of that, right? And they and they have the pain, okay, in that area between them being educated enough to feel the pain and them being educated enough to overcome the pain is is where the the consumer buys. So like, for example, if I want a new shirt, okay, and I'm looking around in stores and I'm, and I'm window shopping and I'm sort of making a decision, like if I have a sort of set criteria of what kind of a shirt I want to buy, when I am alerted to finding that shirt, okay, and then purchasing that or not purchasing that shirt or having a, a shirt like that. So for example, if I see something like that I like, that, that I really like, well, that's going to increase the likelihood of purchasing because now I know I like that shirt. That's a really good option. So what happens is, is in this state, okay, as soon as I've, I've identified that I've, I, I, I like a product that meets or is similar to the needs that I want, my, I become in a state of being prepared to buy. Okay. So what, what can this look like? This could look like, you know, someone coming in to buy, let's say a pair of pants, and then they see a, a shirt that they really like. So you say, well, why don't you try that on? And we've actually got these pants as well that go really well with that shirt. So because there's that instant semi-interest in, oh, I like that shirt, now I am more, you know, like malleable. Now I'm more influential, like not influential, but influenced. I'm easier influenced by suggestion. So that's a key thing is that when we are creating the language, okay, and we are, you know, with the body language and all of that, what we're looking to do is use language, use tonalities that pique that interest, okay, to where they go, oh, this is actually a product or service that I could, I could have, I could buy. So for example, to give you an example out of the property industry, when I was doing first home buyers and selling, selling first homes, um, what used to happen is there was a point in which a, a consumer or, or a client or a first home buyer becomes emotionally engaged into the purchase. What we used to call it is the, the, the real sort of effect. So it's the, the realization that this could be my land, the realization that I could have you know, the house I want on here. Like I can afford this. The bank says I can afford this. Like, do you understand? So prior to that point, it's quite difficult to get, for example, paperwork to get actions done and things like that. But upon that point, the realization is that this is real. I can have this. And then because they realize or, or not so much because they realize that, but because that happens where they say, I want this. Do you sort of get it? So it's that point of someone realizing like, oh, I desire that. And that's what we're trying to do with our communication when we're selling is we're trying to find, we're trying to communicate in a way that is relatable, okay, to that person, to that individual, to that client in a way in which it is easy for them to discern and understand meaning, to understand complex 
situation. So think about it like social media marketing, highly complex, but if we're able to explain it in a simple way to where they can grasp the effectiveness and the sort of value of it, the utility of it, then it sort of becomes like, oh, I can have this. I see how I see how it can be beneficial. And that's the key with the communication. All right, well, I'll see you on the next one and I'll talk to you later. Thanks so much. Bye.